äh, Ben Wagner und Thomas Dullien aka Halver Flag äh, werden uns ja, ein Update, sage ich mal, zum Thema Export von Überwachungstechnologie und Wasener Abkommen äh, geben. Von daher bleiben wir auch thematisch zumindest in der gleichen Ecke. Schön, dass ihr da seid. Äh, herzlich willkommen. furchtbar leer werden wird, sobald man mit diesem schrecklichen Thema anfängt. Aber es tut sich so viel und es ist so oft ein großes Thema, dass es sinnvoll ist, immer wieder neu mit dem Thema Wassner anzufangen, weil man immer wieder merkt, dass zum einen nicht klar ist, woher das überhaupt kommt, warum das relevant ist für Menschen, die sich mit diesen Themen beschäftigen und warum es viele verschiedene Vorschläge braucht, um darüber zu reden und darüber zu verstehen, was sich da eigentlich entwickelt. Die Herkunft noch mal ganz kurz, warum reden wir über dieses Thema und jetzt We're going to continue the rest of this talk in English, so apologies for anybody, it's a little bit la easier for the rest of the audience to listen. For the last five years, we've been getting increasing amounts of evidence that large parts of the technologies used to surveil, to censor, to do all sorts of things that are not particularly friendly to human rights in the world are somewhere developed in Europe, developed in North America by a relatively small group of companies. And that these technologies are not only used to target people, But in cases like Syria, they're also directly used to kill people. And we know that that's not limited to places like Syria, but certainly in these specific cases, we know that it's quite an effective and quite an efficient means for states to control their citizens. So knowing all of this, and knowing that this is an issue, I'm sure you've seen all of these reports before, they're not particularly new to you. The point is that when you look at the scale and when you look at the substance, you always keep coming back to a small group of companies and a small group of countries, which are from different parts of the world exporting these technologies, let me go one slide further, to different parts of the world. So you have all manner of relatively nasty technologies being used in many parts of the world. And so we know through leaks, we know through documents that they're being used, we know the context of this. What hasn't been very clear is what's going to be done about it. There's been all sorts of suggestions on how to respond to this. One way that has been used to respond sp quite specifically is through the Vasna arrangement. And there were three forms of uh, challenges that were used to respond to that. 2012, IMSI catchers, which were added to the list and saying these need to be controlled in some ways by governments at an international level. Then targeted surveillance technologies and then mass surveillance technologies. And we're talking specifically now about the targeted surveillance technologies and some of the challenges we've had with those. All right, so <coughs> the reason uh, I'm here is mostly to talk about how the targeted surveillance technology definition in Basna was particularly badly chosen and leads to all sorts of havoc um, and more or less to the opposite of what we wanted or what, what people wanted to achieve um, when they designed this legislation or this, this agreement. So uh, there's three clauses in the agreement that cover the regulation of things. Um, the first two are more, more or less identical. They cover software and hardware for generation operation delivery uh, and communication with intrusion software and the last one pertains to any technology for the development of intrusion software. As you can see, um, all of this uh, twists and turns on the question of what exactly is intrusion software. And there's a fairly lengthy pseudo-technical definition in the, in the Vasnar agreement that um, attempts to define intrusion software. And uh, the crux of the issue is that this definition is ridiculously bad um, and, well, covers all sorts of things that it shouldn't cover. The big problem with the current Vasnar text, as uh, it was agreed to in 2013, is that we have significant unintended capture, meaning we've got tons of false positives. There's literally a million things that are currently falling under export control that you really don't want to have under export control. And the only reason that nobody knows about this is because everybody is in silent non-compliance, meaning nobody's actually complying with these regulations at the moment because you can't literally can't function as a security professional if you were to adhere to these things. Microsoft tried to count how many export licenses they would need just for handling um, security data internally, and they quit counting after 10,000. And that's more than usually, like, is, is usually issued a year or something like this. Anyhow, um, long story short, uh, just to, to show some things that are currently controlled by these, these regulations that are clearly not in anybody's interest, or especially not in, in civil society's interest to be controlled. Um, we, we saw that technology for intrusion software is controlled. If I find a critical bug in your web browser now, 
and this web browser happens to be manufactured by a US company, I cannot report this bug to the, the US company and give them 30 days to fix it without asking my local government for an export license. Now this is a bit crazy. Let's assume you're in a small European country where the government wants to acquire uh, security vulnerabilities in major browsers. And they don't really have the means to do, th do so otherwise. Now, if you're researching in that country, you can be more or less coerced to give vulnerability data to your local government first before you give it to the party that can actually fix them. And that's clearly insane and not what anybody wanted. Um, the other thing that is, is quite horrific about these regulations is that academic research um, and teaching materials about uh, ASLR and DEP bypasses, which are two countermeasures that are specifically mentioned in Vassanar, that are, well, normal teaching when you teach people how to write exploits and how attacks actually function, these things are now covered by export controls as well, which means if you're going to give a training at uh, a large industry conference, you need to get a separate export license for every individual country that you will receive students of in your class. Um, most likely, most professors that lecture about security vulnerabilities and how they're exploited are violating export restrictions by lecturing to an audience which may include people of other nations, depending on how the, the export regulation is interpreted locally. So that's clearly insane, and this destroys the ability of civil society to even understand attacks. And this is clearly not what you want, because you need, like you don't want the knowledge on how computer systems are attacked to disappear in somebody's basement and only be used for offensive purposes, right? You, you need that discussion. Um, uh, other things that are, are covered by the current text, and that's clearly insane, um, sandboxes that interact with malicious, like with intrusion software to observe what they're doing. Because by definition, they communicate with that malware, right? So they're also caught by the current formulation. Um, pen testing tools such as Core Impact, uh, Immunity Canvas, whatever, as long as they're not generally public available, as soon as you make a modification to them, they're covered. It gets even more insane. Even if you have an open source project and you make a change locally yourself to that open source project, now if you submit a patch to the other party, you are exporting a modified version of an intrusion piece, uh, like a, of, of intrusion software. So it's not quite clear whether you can even do this without consulting a lawyer first. So all of this is insane. You can start a, a pub game where the first person loses that can't come up with another unintended capture of the current Vasna language. And I can assure you the person that loses that game is the first person to ever lose that game, meaning the first person that can't come up with one, like with a new one anymore, the first person that can't come up with another unintended capture anymore. There's just millions of them. So why is the language so fantastically bad? Um, now, Vasnar is not, well, what's happening is Vasnar tries to have objective criteria, technical criteria, by which to distinguish good from bad, meaning, um, well, they cover all sorts of things, uh, high performance computing, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in all of these cases, they have objective criteria, well, starting from this performance threshold. Like, if your chip can operate underneath this temperature, then it's probably not for civilian use, so then it's bad. Um, the trouble is that for um, many hardware fields, or many fields, this seems to work properly, it fails dramatically for intrusion software. Um, nobody has been able, over the last year of discussions about this, to come up with a credible technical definition of intrusion software that doesn't include huge amounts of unintended capture. Um, so the big question is, is it feasible to define intrusion software in a way that the gammas and hacking teams of the world are covered by this, because nobody wants these click and play surveillance platforms in the wrong hands, without, well, uh, a, a thousand unwanted side effects? So, um, I don't know whether there is a way, but um, a few friends of mine and me made an attempt at, at formulating language that may work. We don't know. What we did is we looked at um, uh, a similar conundrum when it comes to distinguishing backup software from DRM software, um, where a lot of the, the question, well, if this backup software happens to bypass DRM measures, <coughs> is this legal or not? Where a lot of that question depends on the manifest intent of the software authors, meaning are they building the software and distributing it and telling people, use this to break DRM and pirate stuff, or are they actually trying to sell a backup solution or distribute a backup solution? So we thought about intrusion software and what is the essence of intrusion software. And if you think about it, um, it's not the technical characteristics of intrusion software, it's mostly the use against a non-consenting other party. Meaning, 
intrusion software wants to hack somebody's computer that doesn't want that to happen at that moment. It doesn't seem to be a very, very difficult definition, but it's very difficult to put this in into, uh, well, export control language. So the suggestion that we're coming up with is that the focus should be on the intent of the designer of the software. Did the designer of the software design this thing specifically so it can be used against people against their consent or against their authorization? We have to be a bit, bit careful because consent is not a word that happens in export control and authorization is a very loaded word because in most <laughs> oppressive regimes, the law enforcement agencies are by definition authorized. So we're using a very specific definition of authorization that is much more close to consent than just legally authorized, which means the owner of the device or the owner and user of the device needs to have authorized the other party for this software to be used against or on, on his device. Um, and then we, we have a fairly wide-ranging exemption for, uh, well, exporting stuff for defensive purposes, which means if I, for, for some reason, find the Gamma or hacking team server-side software on my machine, I can export it if my purpose is to actually protect other people from being hacked by this. So I can send this to Citizen Lab or, or whatever. And so just to give a concrete example of what that means, we just had somebody up here from Bangladesh who was very concretely talking about what it is like to be in an environment of surveillance and where you're constantly wondering about what it's like to be spied upon, to have death threats, to have things happening around you. And so if you think about these examples in a very concrete case like Bangladesh, it's at least an attempt to say on the one hand you'd have less authorization for police forces in the sense that they wouldn't automatically be authorized, but also that you would have ways of responding both for human rights defenders on the ground and at the same time you'd be trying to ensure that specific attempts to get around that person's consent and to ensure that he no longer has control of his computer would be limited. There's an, an interesting loop back to Mr. Shah's comment on uh, what does consenting to something even mean if there's no alternative, right? Because that's something we are, you'll have to watch out for if you implement this. Um, it's quite possible that an oppressive regime will say, well, by living in our country, you automatically consent to us hacking your phone. And, but th that's, that's not our problem right now. I mean, that's a, a relatively uh, far-fetched problem at the moment. Anyhow, um, we've been working on this language for a while. We're not sure whether this will work. We're not even sure whether export control is the right tool for the task, but we are, we've made a fairly... Uh, fairly tedious uh, attempt and, and long-winded attempt, long-winded in terms of it's not the greatest thing in the world to work on export control language. Uh, we've, we've made an effort at trying to reconcile the problem, like the, the, the interests of the security research community and the interests of the, the group of people that would like these tools to be more strictly controlled. We've tried to come up with a compromise language. It's unclear whether it'll work, um, but we think our language is better. We are not aware of any unintended capture of the new language that we've come up with. Um, our language captures a couple of things better than the old language. The old language had some, some exemptions that were uh, a bit too broad. For example, if I had intrusion software that would just disable your cryptographic functionality on your phone and thus allow other intercept elsewhere, that would not have been covered by the original uh, or by the current Bosnar language because that only means, like that only covers actual exfiltration of data or modification on site. Disabling crypto itself would not be covered. Hypervisors got a very, very broad exemption in the, in the language. Um, so if a government writes a hypervisor rootkit, that would not be intrusion software for some bizarre reason. Um, so that's covered in the, in the new language as well. Um, we're confident that it still covers uh, the hacking teams and finfishers of the world. And if you want to spend uh, a day or two reading uh, somewhat <laughs> tedious but uh, interesting legalese. There's a, a short link which I recommend you write down uh, before we skip to the next slide. And, yeah. <laughs> we'll stay on this slide for a second, just to give you a second to write it down. And also just to mention one or two other points on that. I think it's important because we've been discussing this language for a while in many different fora. There's some, been some great proposals also by Sergei Bratos, by other people involved in this debate to just attempt to try and find language that does with some of the challenges, with some of the difficulties of the existing definition. And I think the important thing that can be said about this language is one of the first proposals I've seen that does something quite difficult. That's why we original, uh, originally called this talk sort of the idea of squaring the circle. On the one hand, you've managed to slightly better define the language around what actually is meant to be caught, so the nasty surveillance technologies, which means potentially more of the bad things, the things that are harming and infringing on human rights can be caught on the one hand. And on the other hand, you're in a situation that you're removing, at least to the best extent possible, as we know of the language at this point in time, the unintended capture. 
And just to, as a sort of a, an appeal, I know this is tedious, and I, I share the, the incredible frustration of working with Vasana language. It is a huge pain in the ass. I, it's like there's no nice way of putting it. It's not fun, it's not enjoyable, you won't feel great, and you won't produce sort of wonderful, wonderful memories afterwards. But what you will do, and if you genuinely take the time to look at this language, which I can strongly recommend, because it's the best proposal that I'm aware of at this point, is that you'll contribute to moving the debate a little bit forward, because these things are regulated right now. In some way or another, they probably will be regulated in future. And so to ensure that given that is the way it is, we at least should ensure that there's the best possible language out there, and that the, the proposals that are out there are strong enough and are substantive enough. And there are several important reasons for that. The first and most obvious one is that this is ongoing discussion as part of the European Parliament. And apart from this whole debate in Vasana, you have a proposal that is coming out from the European Commission probably sometime around March of this year, so in about four to eight weeks. And what that means is that this debate is not just going to be at the level of Vasana, but also in Europe in the sense of what sort of expectations do we have on technologies that are exported from Europe, where do we think this debate is going to go? And Europe is, has in the past been willing and is likely to be willing in future to go a few steps further than Vasana and try to do things even better. And so the challenge there is again, what are gonna be the debates that are gonna be had? Will they be based on solid proposals? Will they be actually moving the debate forward? Or will they be behold to certain interests? Will they make the NSAs of this world very happy? What are gonna be the consequences of these challenges? So please stay engaged in this debate. Don't forget it. Don't just say, ah, Vasana is that ugly word that I don't want to hear because it's so complicated language. And also, this is the sort of the ongoing debates that are happening with the update. And finally, one point that I think is always needs to be mentioned in this report, there's this debate that we say the crypto wars were won. And to a certain degree, that's incredibly true. And yet still, in the same Vasana agreement that we have right now, language on the control of cryptography is still included. And this is strange because all of the private companies involved, all of the civil society involved, every actor that you ask involved says, crypto controls are a really bad and stupid idea. They shouldn't exist. And yet they still exist. And so in the updating of the language of uh, targeted controls of surveillance technologies, we shouldn't forget that there's lots of other, you could call it sort of legacy controls in there, which have already done a lot of harm, where to a certain extent exemptions were found in the United States, but for lots of other countries in the world, these controls still exist. And so I don't think the exemptions were sufficient. There's been discussions about creating a general export authorization for all cryptography in general that would remove that, or just even better striking them out of the Vasana language completely. There are lots of ways of doing that, but I think I don't need to say it even more strongly to anybody in this room. I'm sort of preaching to the choir. We realize that it's a very stupid idea to regulate or try to regulate cryptography. I think you'll have a hard time finding somebody that opposes removing uh, encryption controls from Vasana, I think. Uh except in some national security circles, but exactly. in general, nobody here will oppose. This. But that's the whole point, and we should emphasize how isolated those national security circles are, but in order to do that, people in this room and people outside there in general who are listening to the webcast need to speak up, because only through that we'll show that this is only this one small interest group who actually has an interest in doing this and manipulating this language, and everybody else has a different opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. Uh, thanks for sharing your um, Vorschlag. <laughs> suggestion with us. Um, actually, we don't really have the time for Q&A, but maybe one, one quick question over there. So, oh, whoa. So the problem appears to be that you need to make a definition of what you want to be exported or not and they try to define that based on the intent of what it's um, exported for. So, so, so I, I can't contact. hear you at the moment because everybody else is too loud. So uh, I give you... Um, but it appears to me that you cannot really define the intent of a software. So I'd like to hear more about how you're trying to tackle that exact problem in your proposal. And we'll, sorry, you'll have to wait. We'll have two more questions that you'll have to answer. Um, I didn't quite get how you are trying to actually influence the, the, um, the, the, the amendments. Are you a private person entering a submission or are you affiliated with the organization? I'm just interested in how you do it. 
One last remark? No? <laughs> okay, same question. All right, so for the first question, the first question was um, how do you actually, well, determine intent? And um, I think in most cases that we care about, it's very, very clear cut. If you look at the marketing material that Gamma was distributing, if you look at the service they were offering, if you look at the sort of support they were offering to various governments, there's no doubt that their intent was to hack people that don't want to be hacked at that moment, um, right? So, um, and if people now argue that a lot of stuff um, may be used maliciously, um, that where, where the intent is less, less obvious, that is a, to a certain extent by design, because we do want to avoid the overcapture. And if you look at the evidence from Hacking Team and from Gamma, these guys are not subtle. Like, they advertise aggressively hack your dissidents using our software. They don't call them dissidents, but solve your whatever surveillance needs using the software. There's no... So I, I haven't actually seen a commercial or um, a, a security or a, a, an intrusion software product deployed against dissidents anywhere where there was any doubt about the intent of that tool, if that makes any sense. Microphone. So just as an example, you have something like Metasploit. In the middle, you have something like uh, Wupen's government services. And on the far right, <laughs> you probably have Gamma and um, hacking teams. So where exactly do you draw the line? I mean, that, that's the challenge here, right? And that's what I'm interested in. So the, the line, um, in my opinion, is drawn like what is the intention of the author when writing that thing? Because the intention of Metasploit is very clearly not hacking people. It's not designed for stealth, it doesn't, like when, when an antivirus adds a signature, it's not that Metasploit is updated or gives you guarantees of an update within a day that's not detected anymore. Stuff like this. Um, so my, my point of view is if the software is clearly designed for hacking people against their will, and uh, yeah, there, there is a certain amount of gray area at the, the edge, and if you're very, very close to the edge, then um, you probably want to speak to a lawyer who then asks for an export license. Um, but I think for, like, let's say Core Impact. Core Impact is a penetration testing tool. Nobody in his right mind, no, no real attacker in his right mind would try to use that for an actual attack. Um, so the, there is a gray area, but there's a gray area in any legal text. And there's a, and I'm not saying that we can eliminate the gray area because legal, legalese is not code in that sense, right? Um, we're trying to mi minimize it to as best as we can. Sorry if this is not a great and very satisfactory answer. But I think um, it's also a stronger answer than a lot of the stuff we've had so far, and it also contributes to really moving the debate forward. And I also don't think we need to be stopped in this debate just by people saying, ah, we're not sure whether this fits into your regime or not, or whether it fits into our agreement. The whole point of proposing things like this or having ideas like this is to say this is where the law should be at and if it's not there yet we need to push it in that direction by setting a clear goal and targeting the exact things that are meant to be targeted rather than saying that it's not doing what we want because the system can't fulfill our, our ideas or our hopes. Specifically on the advocacy question of which venues and forums this is happening, there's a sort of a split on the one hand between sort of the more civil society oriented forums where people are still speaking about human rights violations and sort of the more technically oriented forums where people are speaking about definitions of technology. And it's important to bring those together and ensure that those are happening next to each other. But that also involves trying to come up with joint proposals. We spent a lot of time talking about this. I'm not sure we agree on every detail, but the point is that we feel comfortable enough making a joint talk here that we have a better proposal than what's out there to ensure that the debate moves forward and that there's more of a debate with each other than about each other. I think that's the main point of this talk. Okay. And some quick remarks on the second question, your role in this whole game. Right, so uh, my personal role are, are two roles. Okay. Uh, ben, ben mentioned that there's uh, different areas where this is being discussed, and my role is um, I've been doing security research for 15 years plus, um, and I've worked, like I've run, run a small company that did reverse engineering tools, and then I worked for Google for a couple of years, and I worked on uh, the Rowhammer uh, security issue where a lot of faulty RAM was uh, in many laptops leading to security issues. So I've seen security research as a private person, I've seen it in smaller co companies, I've seen it in bigger companies. Um, so I approach this from a very technical side where I know people and I talk to them and I write the document and then, or I don't write the document, I co-write the document with the other authors of the document which actually do m most of the work. 
and then we circulate it amongst people that we know, and then we get feedback, and then we publish a version, and we hope that people actually listen to what we're saying, if that makes any sense. At the moment, I'm uh, not employed anywhere. I've taken a year off. Does that answer all of your questions? Right now, we're not submitting the proposal. We're circulating uh, the proposal. Um, we, we're no, not an entity that can submit anything in that sense. Vasnar is an international agreement, which means that negotiation teams from the foreign ministries of whoever's attending need to hash out what they're proposing. Our hope is to, um, in a very polarized debate where two sides are yelling at each other, uh, we're trying to suggest some sort of middle ground that people can agree to that may lead to a compromise which gets the language fixed. And the great thing about this, just to finalize and then we'll really end the close, it's that there's, it's submitted by three private citizens in this case in a very specific context. And those private citizens just have good ideas and good suggestions. And I don't want to take any credit for that proposal in that sense. I've more recognized it and hope that we can, through this proposal, continue um, improving the way that the debate is happening because this really creates a, a space for progress and also to ensure that we both make sure that the technologies are caught, but they're not caught in a way that we need to trash the whole system and we can still ensure that the, the overcapture and the, the bad implementations aren't happening anymore. All right. Thank you, Ben and Halva. I guess you two will stick around for another beer at least and be open to discussion. Okay.